Okay, our second presentation is uh, the one that was due to be given yesterday, but she was gracious enough to postpone it for us, and it's by our very own Daniela osatsky Stelm. She will introduce herself and the, the talk. Please, Daniela. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here, and thanks all of you for being here, and Chaim, especially you, for organizing such an amazing conference or a workshop. I will um, share my screen, and please let me know if you can see it. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So ego documents are invaluable sources for Holocaust research that in recent years gained new significant and interest among academics. They are central for our understanding of the historical events of individual thoughts and behaviors. Through reading ego documents, we can construct the historical story from bottom up. In my presentation today, I will focus on one such ego document. It is a unique Holocaust diary written about the ghetto of Oshmiana, West Belarus. Oshmiana was part of the Vilna district, close to the border between Lithuania and Belarus. Um, after the German invasion of the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa, June 1941, about 4,000 Jews were detained in Oshmiana. A Judenrat was appointed and one of its members was a 35-year-old woman named Inda Deul. She wrote a diary in Polish language about the events that unfolded the town and the ghetto. Her diary contains two notebooks with a total of 131 pages. It sheds light on crucial events in this under-researched place and in fact provides us with an extraordinary insight on Jewish experiences during the Holocaust overall. In a short introduction to her diary, the Ul writes, if somehow in a lucky way I will survive the war and stay alive, I will dedicate my time to precise processing of my thoughts and of the history of our ghetto in Oshmiana. So, it is clear that she had an historical vision of documenting the abnormal events she was living in. She did not survive the war. We do not have many biographical details about her, not even exact knowledge on her death. Nonetheless, in my opinion, it makes the study of her diary even more interesting. In her diary, Deul talks about the events in the town since the German invasion on June 25, 1941. She recounts the arrest and murder of Jewish men in mass shootings just outside the town at the beginning of Nazi occupation. Through the diary, we can also learn about Jewish and non-Jewish relations through small anecdotes that she describes. She also talks about the German commanders describing their character and difference in behavior between them and how they were perceived by the Jewish population. Interestingly, between the lines, we can listen to the Ul's own voice, what she personally experienced during the event what she thought and how she felt. Additionally, the diary describes in detail a controversial event that occurred in Oshmiana Ghetto in late October 1942, a violent action carried out by Jewish policemen from Vilna Ghetto at the order of the Germans. So who was in the Deul? What do we know about her? Unfortunately, not much. 
She was born in 1906 to her parents, Eliyahu Eli Leib, a merchant, and Nechama. She had a brother, Chaim, who was also a teacher in Tarbut school, and a sister, Esther, and three nephews. Hinda was single, had no children of her own, and worked as a teacher. Perhaps that is why she could volunteer to work in the Judenrat. How did she come up with the idea to write a diary? What was her purpose? She wrote it on two notebooks in a nightly orderly way. Interestingly, she did not put any dates on the entries, so we don't know for sure when exactly it was written and for how long. Perhaps it was a draft for future expansion. I assume that she wrote the diary in the spring or summer of 1943 while she was already in the Vilna ghetto after the liquidation of the Oshmiana ghetto in April 1943 she was transferred to Vilna ghetto and while being there I believe she wrote her fresh memories from Oshmiana in the deportations of the end of August beginning of September 1943, she was deported from Vilna to forced labor camp in Estonia and was murdered in a camp, perhaps in Latvia, in 1944. On the cover of the diary, it is written in Hebrew private. Who wrote it? We don't know. Another mystery is how did this diary survive and how it arrived at Israel. And, also, and although it was known to exist, why it was not used more in the historiography. She wrote the diary very hastily, fearing that death might surprise her during her work. She asked that if she will die, which is very probable, the notebooks will be given to Moshe Golubok. Before death, I send you my regards, thinking of you in the Deul, she writes. The diary starts with a sentence, and so it began in Oshmiana. The Germans entered the city on June 25, 1941. The Jews at that time lived in proximity to the Christians, Therefore, it was a Polish youth who guided the Germans to the Jewish home. The soldiers filled their pockets with Jewish loot, and the Poles took radios. Also, all the bicycles were taken from the Jews. The Germans went through the town and took carts and horses that belonged to, to the Jews. They called Rabbi Heller an interesting character and ordered him to form a Judenrat consisting of eight men. Hinda's father was one of them. On, on uh, Thursday, July 25, 1941, so like one month after the occupation, the Judenrat received an order to prepare a list of all Jewish men between the ages 17 to 65 who lived in Oshmiana. If the list will not be prepared in time or will not be accurate, the Judenrat members will be shot to death. At evening, the men gathered to discuss how to prepare the list to avoid as many victims as possible. But the Germans did not wait for the list. The next morning, an SS battalion, followed by locals, took out Jewish men from their houses and brought them to the market square, forcing them to lay with their faces to the ground. Anyone who dared lift his head was beaten. When the square was full, the 700 men were marched outside of the town and killed in a village nearby. You can see the mass grave over here. Among the men were also Inda's father and brother and all the Judenrat members. So in the town, mostly women and children were left. Inda writes that rumors 
spread that before killing the men, they were abused by their perpetrators, forcing them to sing, eat dirt, and more. The local administration said that the rumors are false and that the men were deported to forced labor camps. And until now, many women are expecting the return of their husbands and sons, she writes, indicating how the remaining Jews were deceived not only by the Germans, but also by the locals. She expands on the change in the locals' attitude towards the Jews. The farmers in the market were afraid to sell for Jews. Polish acquaintances stopped saying hello. Jews who passed by in the street were abused and sometimes killed by locals and there was no one to complain to. So you can really feel the helplessness of the Jewish population. The first time we are hearing Hinda's own voice is when she describes that there was a need to supply working hands to the military administration and the commander was looking for a Jewish woman who will take it upon herself to organize the problem of the workers. I volunteered, and day by day, at a certain time, I started facing him to receive orders. Additionally, I also received from him information regarding the Jewish population. I collected requests and brought them to him. Interestingly, every time she writes about the Judenrat, she uses we. So she saw herself as an inseparable, inseparable part of the Judenrat. Hinder writes that in the town, there were rumors about establishing a ghetto. As the instruction to move to the ghetto were given, the women stopped talking about their lost husbands and sons because they thought only about one thing where to put their belongings so they will not be stolen from them. Many chose to give their property to Christians for safeguards. Signs were hanged on the ghetto's borders. Entrance to non-Jews is forbidden. A fence was erected and the Jews had to pay for it. Jews from surrounding towns were deported to the Oshmiana ghetto. During the ghetto's establishment, there, were, there was no German supervision, but instead a local by the name Skshat, a descent man, according to her. A second Judenrat was established and also Jewish police. In November, the Germans took over Oshmiana and the commander in charge, Mocker, is described by her as savage, screaming like an animal and like predator was thirsty for blood. She tells of a horrible act of mocker as he shot to death three Jewish women. The fear from this German was huge, she writes. She describes the murder of Roma uh, gypsies uh, carried out by the Germans. One of the Judenrat's members was once present in such an execution and told what he saw. He also, uh, uh, there was a, however, one German who was good and tried to help. He was a cook of Mocker and was called by the alias Koch. She's also telling about a Belarusian named Koladko who was good and helped save Jews. She describes Martin Weiss, the German commander, as an opposite of Mocker character. He was quiet, in self-control, speaking quietly, answer hello, did not shout rouse, but he was extreme, and if he ordered something, it had to be done. He had a good taste according to her, and ordered the Judenrat to decorate his apartment with carpet and nice furniture because he had a Polish mistress 
and he wanted to receive her nicely. Hinda is telling about a new phase in the ghetto that all property had to be taken out from the Jewish houses. The search was conducted by the Jewish police thoroughly because it wasn't worthy to risk lives for the sake of rugs. If locals who were in good relationships with the Germans wanted something, they sent them to the ghetto so the Jews would have to provide them with anything. When there were some cases of typhus epidemic in the ghetto, the Germans threatened that they will take all measures needed should the disease spread. From that moment, they did not know anything about our diseases in the right. In another case, the Judenrat tried to bribe the Germans so they will not murder 26 Jews who tried to escape and were caught. However, the Germans took all the presents and bribe and nonetheless killed the escapees. Interestingly, she writes about rescuing Jewish books that the Germans ordered to burn. The Judenrat did burn some, but managed to hide others inside walls of houses, especially religious books. This reminds us, or reminds me, the story of the paper brigade in the Vilna ghetto that saved Jewish books and writings. As the Judenrat tried to save the Jewish population, the Jews did not fully believe their leaders and not always followed orders, which according to her risked the ghetto and made the Judenrat job harder. When the Germans requested handing over people, the Judenrat mostly tried not to separate families. In couple of instances, when they had to choose people to be deported, we sat all night to list the people. How not to take the last son from the house and not to take from a family its provider. We were careful not to take from children their mothers. Inda, Inda's diary is important also because she describes all sorts of small anecdotes of the maltreatments of the Germans toward the Jews. So by describing the small daily humiliations and downfall, the picture of what Jews had to face with is revealed. What is apparent in the diary is a lack of order in the ghetto. Instructions were unclear. Jews were living in uncertainty. For example, there was no medical doctor in the ghetto and it was difficult to consult on medical issues. Moral dilemmas are described in the diary as well. The Judenrat tried to save Jews by tricking the Germans, but had to keep it in secret and the Jews accused the Judenrat of not assisting them. One of the most important descriptions in her diary is the event that became known as the action in Oshmiana. Yaakov Gens, head of the Judenrat in the Vilna ghetto, and Salek Dessler, head of the Jewish police, oversaw the action. They took it upon themselves to deliver to the Germans about 400 people from Oshmiana. They wanted to take the elders and the sick in order to save the young and the strong. This controversial event is, de is described in the diary with some insights and details. The Oshmiana Judenrat was in on the secret and knew that the young are being replaced by the elders. She describes two young men who knew their fathers are among the victims and wanted to save them. They tried to sneak to the killing site in order to find their fathers, but were caught and killed as well. One of the interesting comprehensions she writes is, 
I quote, this is a pure psychological phenomenon that after bloodshed, there is a rise in the ghetto of strong willingness to live. The ghetto began to rehabilitate itself and in a short time, the ghetto was rehabilitated. It got the character of a small town, well organized, life improved. The survivors of the action worked and produced. The food was better, there was no hunger. And for five months, the new good life lasted. When spring 1943 came, beginning of April, we received an official announcement. The Oshmiana ghetto will be liquidated. According to her, on April 28, the Judenrat members were deported to Vilna. The ghetto in Oshmiana ceased to exist. The diary is ended by describing the action of liquidation of the small ghettos in the Vilna district that most were murdered in Ponar, Ponari death site near Vilna. Some people survived. They tell terrifying things. The belongings of the murdered that were collected in the train cars, as well as from the slaughter field, were brought to Vilna. The best items stayed at the Gestapo. The worst sent to the ghetto. On the parcels, we read the family names of acquaintances. This is how the diary ends. In the Deul was one Jewish woman who lived through the Holocaust and perished. She left us this invaluable gift, her diary, which is one of the most important ego documents, ego documents of a neglected town in Holocaust historiography. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniela, for a fascinating talk.